for the first time in close to 20 months, I found myself last night with my wife sitting in a movie theater. And it wasn't a movie that promised entertainment. It wasn't a movie that promised excitement. It wasn't a movie that we had seen as one of our top 10 movie list that we had to make up while the time was right. The documentary by a very dear friend and Roman member, Matthew Heineman, the director of Cartel Land and a number of remarkable documentaries. The movie is called First Wave. And it's a movie about the four months in the spring of 2020 where New York City experienced the horrors of of an epidemic that became a pandemic. And in excruciating detail, he brought all of us in the Beacon Theater last night back into the horror and the uncertainty and the pain, the grief, the shock, the confusion, the anger, the residue of all that that is still regnant and alive in all of us, I think. And he also told the story of a number of remarkable heroes and heroines, first responders, doctors, and nurses, and in particular, two individuals in the movie who survived the worst imaginable experience of COVID and lived to tell the story. And on the stage afterwards, when all of us were in tears and in cathartic release, the individuals who were part of the film were asked what it was about the film, what was it that made Matthew and others, why did they feel it was important to tell this story? After all, so many of us who were in the room last night already know the story. We were there, we heard the sirens, we saw the images. We lived with it here in New York. What was it about the documentary that was so absolutely necessary? And so they told us a couple of things that I want to relate to a story that we tell ourselves each and every year at this time of the year. And the lessons of that biblical story, that biblical archetype, that story for all time and how it relates to their story. They said that in order for them to feel and for all of us to know what went on behind the scenes, there was no other way. Even with the graphic images that we saw projected on our news screens, even if we saw and experienced so much of what the film depicted, there was so much behind the scenes that we could never know. And knowing what went on behind the scenes raised our appreciation and our kindness. It raised our capacity to appreciate and give the benefit of the doubt when we don't know and we can only imagine and fathom. Seeing it really mattered. The second piece of what they said, of course, was that it was important to tell the story because even if it feels like it was so long ago, it still has painful residue in the present moment. We aren't over it, and we might never be over it. And the third thing they said was, of course, the importance of telling the triumph to tell the stories of human capacity to endure, the human heart's capacity to be broken and to be set again, the absolutely remarkable way that human beings have of finding strength when there doesn't seem to be, finding hope when there doesn't seem for it to be possible, and finding one another when it seems that we can't find one another. 
All of this happens, of course, in tomorrow morning's documentary called Torah. In that story, Jacob, who is me, who is you, who is every one of us, Jacob, our patriarch, the one who was on the run his entire life, the one who feels as if he can't be blessed unless he lies, he can't receive the attention he deserves unless he dresses up as someone other than who he is. Jacob, the one who lives the hero's journey. Each and every year we come back to Jacob because we're named for him. To be one of Yisrael happens in chapter 32 of the book of Genesis. It happens tomorrow morning in the Jacob saga. Jacob has run away from his brother and 20 years later, something that he had avoided his entire life comes back to haunt him and to find him. Chapter 32 will detail that Jacob has prepared himself to meet his arch nemesis, his brother Esau, and in preparation, he has split the camp. He has taken all of those whom he loves and placed them on the other side of a river named Yabok, mysteriously sounding like the name of Jacob himself. Jacob brings all that he loves and makes sure it is safe and then mysteriously at the end of chapter 31, the beginning of chapter 32, Jacob finds himself back on the other side of the river. We don't know how that happened. He's on the other side of the river and then for some reason goes back. And there, mysteriously in chapter 32, Jacob is alone. Jacob is confronted by a mysterious ish, a man whose identity is not told to us in the text some mystery man begins to wrestle with Jacob. And the rabbis teach us that we have every reason to believe that the mysterious man is Sarosh al Esav, the angel of Esav, Esav's spiritual representation. Another way of saying that is Jacob begins to wrestle with his demons. He begins to wrestle with that which in him is known as shadow, that which in him is known as other, that which in him has always been present. Jacob begins to wrestle. And in his wrestling match, the Torah tells us, he sees that he can't overcome this ish, this man, this thing. And then he's touched in his hip socket and it's dislocated. And then he ends by asking the angel to bless him. I will not let you go, he says, until you bless me. Jacob lives in all three of the moments that the people yesterday described. We don't know what other people's demons are and what they're wrestling with, do we? Jacob had it all, didn't he? Two wives, Four wives, 11 kids, and a, what does it end? Something in the yard. Life used to be, right? He has it all. He's got it all going on. He's got the two garage. He's got the picket fence. He's got the nice portfolio. He's a big shot rabbi, priest, executive director. Ooh, a doctor. Psh. Dr. Jacob. Had the text not told us that he's wrestling, would we have known? How often in, this, in recovery programs and 12-step work, we talk about and there is spoken about those who judge someone else's outsides against their insides. They see their outsides. Jacob on the outside, whoo! He's got gifts to give. Man, he shows up with his brother Esau right before the party. He's like, okay, I got this much sheep. I'm going to give you this much. You want stocks? I got stocks. You want land? I got land. And the text tells us very powerfully in the most archetypal of ways, in the most profound mythic of ways, that you know something? It doesn't matter what Jacob could have given. What was needed was not what Jacob had not something that he could dispense with. It was his demons that were controlling his life. It was that which he had run from that had caught up to him. Who of us knows 
what goes on and what went on in LIJ behind those doors. Who of us knows what's going on right now behind someone else's doors on your floor in your apartment building? How many of us struggle because for whatever reason we can't let people know what's going on? How many of us so telling, so profoundly important? We live in a world and in this country in this moment where even today on the weekend where we celebrate transgender remembrance, the worst year to date on record of people, 46 humans were murdered this year, were killed this year for violence against them for being non-binary gender identity. Can you imagine a world like that? Killed for being transgender as if that was in any way, shape or form a threat who do we know? We look at someone, who do we know? Who are you? I'm sorry, your heart is beating. Who are you? What do you carry each day? What keeps you up at night? Our forefather Jacob went back each and every day. We go back, someone goes back to fight with a demon. How important must it be for us to give one another a modicum of kindness to see what we're going through if there was one thing that was happening in the pandemic that i begrudgingly said okay thank god it's happening on some levels that we actually got to see what was going on in people's homes how hard it must be to be a single mother a single father a single parent how hard it must be to try to make ends meet how hard it must be how hard not the one that you dress up for because, of course, Zoom allowed us to put all those nice green screens behind. Look how much I read. <laughs> and then your arm moves and there's some green thing going. It's like, you're like, you're like what? Well, the real you, please. It's like, you don't need the green. I was like, that was the best part of the beginning of the pandemic. It was like, people are like, you know, big shot, you know, TV announcers are like. <laughs> Come on, what's going on? What are the demons? And we, began, we were generous with one another. It's like, oh, there's a glitch, I'm sorry. I... You're, you're, you're muted, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, there it is. We were generous, we, get, we were like, hey. And then the second moment, of course, of the movie and of Jacob's life is that he wrestles and he sees that, you know, wrestling with demons leaves scars. How much grief we still carry, how much shaking of the body and of our culture needs to happen for us to come to terms with the violence and the aggression and the danger and the sense that everywhere we went, it was possibly, we could catch something. There's no one here, whether you, contracted COVID or not, who isn't in some way, shape, or form dislocated. And if you still feel it and you wonder, how come I'm not back at optimum productivity? All the kids are back at Columbia University. What's wrong with me? How come I'm not checking off all my boxes? And are you kidding? <laughs> We're all limping. You can't focus because you probably need to cry you can't focus because you still can't believe it. You can't focus because behind closed doors, two years ago, we were in a city where there were mass graves. And at some level, we can imagine other cultures and other societies and other countries where that was normal. All the grief and all the limping. And Jacob isn't whole until he limps. He doesn't arrive whole until he's limping because that limp was true. He was dislocated. He just was a good actor. He's just pulling it all together because we do have to do that. And then the last moment, of course, in this beautiful story, the story ends with this profound thing that I think about all the time. Jacob is wrestling with the angel and he's wounded and all of us are, but he won't let this ish, this mysterious angel or being or his own self leave until it blesses him. 
until you bless me was the phrase. I will let you go until you bless me. I won't let you go until you tell me what it is that I was meant to learn. I won't let you go until you show me what it is I'm meant to do. I won't let you go until somehow, in some profound way, from this, I will make something. I will do something. I will feel something. I will say something. I will see something. I will gift something. I will change something. Till you bless me. To that part in us, to that part in this culture, in this world, to those wounds and to those grievances and to those places where stuff is still continually regurgitating itself in an ever, never ending yearning to be completed of cultural repetition, compulsion, karmic necessity that says, heal me, heal me, heal me. And we say, till you bless me. Until you bless me. That's a sign for Jacob that his wrestling is to some extent over. We're looking for blessings. The blessings of our grief and the blessings of our loss. The blessings of what we've struggled to learn and learn and relearn. I keep that as a mantra in my heart. Till you bless me. Show me what it is that I am meant to know from this. Show me how it is that I might triumph over that which I've struggled with and which has left me wounded and hurt and in some way exposed and vulnerable and wide open and raw till you bless me. What a great charge for all of us at a time where we absolutely need to double down on compassion, to double down on kindness, to double down on generosity, and to open our hearts to the realities that we can't see and the appreciations we absolutely are obligated to offer. May the one who blessed Yaakov, may the one who blessed Jacob and all of us in all of our unknown demons and wrestlings teach us to demand blessing from all of those places in ourselves, in our communities, and in the world. And let us say amen. Please rise, everyone.